I extend a warm welcome to you, dear brothers and sisters, as you join me on another episode of Through the Bible series. In our last study, we talked about two important themes. First, the Word of God, and second, Jesus, our High Priest. We discussed that the Word of God is living, active and energizing. It is double-aged, piercing and dividing even the spirit and the soul. We are reminded that the Word of God discerns our thoughts and knows the intent of our hearts. It can search the deepest depths of the human heart and sit in judgment of it. This is possible more so because all things are naked before God and there is absolutely nothing that is concealed from Him. Our thoughts and motives, our desires and plans, all are bare before God. And so it is best to commit them to Him and trust Him. It is then that we jump to the renewed call of Christ, our High Priest. We learned that for the Hebrew believers who are accustomed to approaching God through their High Priest of the Levitical order, this was a very important position. The author of Hebrews introduces Jesus as our mediator, the priest, through whom every believer has personal access to God. Today, we shall be looking more at the person and privileges that Jesus as our High Priest make available. So without further delays, I welcome you again, dear brothers and sisters, even as you join me on another session of our Bible study. This is Through the Bible series. Thank you for joining us, dear friend. We welcome you very warmly. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 onwards. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. You will notice in your Bible that the word yet is in italics meaning that it has been added by the translators. Christ was tempted without sin, tested without sin. In the testing of Jesus in the wilderness, he could not have fallen because he is the God-man. However, the pressure of testing was actually greater upon him than it would have been upon us. He could say, The prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. John chapter 14 verse 30. Satan finds something in me and in you, each one of us, but he could find nothing in the Lord Jesus. Let's illustrate this. A boat standing in water can only tolerate so much pressure. If the pressure becomes too great, there will be a rip in the hull of the boat and the water will come in, and thus the pressure is removed. That is the way you and I are. We give in to the pressure, we yield, and then the pressure is gone. However, Jesus never did yield, and therefore there was a building up of pressure that you and I never experience. In the same way, the cars of a train all have a weight limit which they can carry. If that limit is exceeded, you will have a car that is bowed down in the middle. It gives in. It can only carry so heavy a load. That is true of all of us. We can carry just so much and not anymore. The weight of temptation Jesus Christ could carry was infinite. He was tested without sin. But he was tested and for that reason he knows how we feel. We have a high priest who understands us. I have always felt that for the nation Israel, the death of Aaron was in one sense of greater significance than the death of Moses. Aaron was their great high priest. Many Israelites had been brought up with Aaron and had played with him as a boy and had gone through the wilderness with him. They could go to Aaron and say, Look Aaron, I did this, and I should not have done it. I have brought my sacrifice. And Aaron could sympathize with them. He knew exactly how they felt. But when Aaron died, I imagine they wondered whether that new priest, the son of Aaron, would understand. Would he be able to sympathize and to help? We have a great high priest who is always available. And he does understand. He does not understand us theoretically. But down here, he was tempted and he was touched 
with the feelings of our infirmities. He knew what it was to hunger. He knew what it was to be touched with sorrow. Jesus wept, remember. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities, yet without sin. Verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here again notice the phrase, let us. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. I must confess that I have never really liked our translation of boldly, but neither do I know how to change it. The word boldly has a thought of being brazen. There is a sort of flippancy suggested by it. That is really not the idea. It is a very interesting word in the Greek, pahisia. It denotes the freedom of speech which the Athenians prized so highly. They were perhaps the first to feel that the average citizen should have freedom to speak. Let us therefore come with great freedom unto the throne of grace. We can speak freely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell him things that I cannot tell anybody. He understands. He knows every weakness. And I might just as well tell him. Each one of us need to learn to be frank with him. It does not mean that you become so down to earth and so buddy buddy that you lose the reverence and the awe that is required. He is God, but we have that access, that freedom to approach him at every stage in our life, anytime, during those crucial times, even on a time when there is just about nothing to say but in an attitude of praise, thanksgiving, gratitude, just to be in his presence. Yes, we can approach him. We can tell him what is on our heart. We can just be silent in his presence. I suspect, therefore, that all these very pious and flowery prayers we make sometimes do not impress him at all because he can see through especially when we are attempting to cover up what is in our hearts and lives. I wonder if the Lord doesn't tune us out when we do not come to Him with freedom and an openness of our hearts to Him. That is one of the reasons our prayer meetings are not more effective. We come to Him rather restrained without being open and sincere. Unto the throne of grace. God's throne is a throne of grace. Formerly, it was a throne of judgment. It is now a mercy seat, a throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. We need a lot of it, don't you think? Mercy is something that is in one sense negative. It speaks of the past. We are redeemed by the mercy of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He has been merciful to me. And find grace to help in time of need. Help is a very positive thing. It speaks of the future. We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of our need in the future. David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want in Psalm chapter 23 verse 1. Of course, he had not wanted in the past. But the beauty of it is that David could say, I shall not want. Why? Because the Lord is his shepherd. I have an high priest up yonder and I can go to him as my shepherd. By the way, have you been to him yet today? What did he tell you? And what did you tell him? Did you tell him that you really love him? Did you confess your sins to him? Well, why don't you? He already knows it. But why don't you tell him? Don't put up a front to him. He always knows that you can come to him only on his merit. Go to him with freedom and talk to him. There is mercy and grace to help in time of need. Now let's proceed onwards to chapter 5. This chapter continues the great theme of Christ as our high priest, showing that he is superior to the Levitical priesthood with which the Hebrews were once so familiar with. 
In the first 10 verses, we have the definition of a priest. Christ, as we have already said, has the threefold office of prophet, priest and king. He is God's final word to man. In Christ, God has said all he intends to say. As a prophet, he spoke over 1900 years ago. Now he is the word of God. He is the priest for the now generation. Someday in the future, he is going to come as a king. Right now, he is our great high priest. We have access to him. He is a great high priest. Just as Aaron was a high priest, and every believer is a priest, just as all the tribe of Levi were priests, we can offer sacrifices to God as priests. Praise is a sacrifice that we can offer. Have you noticed him today? We can also offer our substance, the first fruit of our hands, the fruit of our minds or our time. Believers can make all of these things an offering to him. And prayer is the work of a priest. To recognize our position and privilege eliminates all of the mechanics we have today. It puts aside all of the methods that we use. We see two extreme approaches to God through worship today. One is a very emotional approach and the other is a very ritualistic approach. Both of them are soulish and not spiritual worship at all. We simply need to come to him and get rid of all the mechanics and the methods. Someone sent a story about the astronaut who was in his capsule just ready to close the door in preparation for the launching when a reporter asked him a question. How do you feel when you are an astronaut ready to take off? The astronaut replied, How would you feel if you were sitting on top of 50,000 parts each supplied by the lowest bidder. That is the way many people worship today. They are ritualistic or they are emotional. They go by their feelings rather than by the word of God. The concluding verse of chapter 4 urges us to come in freedom to the throne of grace. We need mercy and we need help. He is in the position to supply these because he is our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 The definition of a priest For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. This verse gives us the definition of a priest. He must be taken from among men, which means he must be a man. He must be a representative, you see. He represents man, but he represents man to God. He is ordained for man in things pertaining to God. Because he goes before God, he must be acceptable to God. That is the suggestion in ordained for men in things to God. In verse 4, we are told specifically that no man takes this honor unto himself. But he that is called of God, as was Aaron, he must be ordained of God. Therefore, a priest is, one, taken from among men, two, he is ordained for men, that is, on behalf of men, and three, goes to God for men. We can now draw a distinction between a priest and a prophet. A priest goes from man to God. He represents man before God. On the other hand, a prophet comes from God to man with a message from God. Therefore, the Old Testament priest did not tell men what God had to say. That was the ministry of the prophet. The priest's ministry was to represent man before God. Now in the present age, our Lord Jesus Christ is the only high priest. It is he who represents us before God. The priesthood functions not for lost sinners, but for saved sinners. You will recall that John said, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 Well, I'm sorry John, 
but you are talking to a boy who has sinned. Even as a child of God, I have sinned. I am thankful that he covered me when he added, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. Christ represents me up there. When my enemy Satan accuses me before the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ represents me. He is my high priest. That is one reason why I would never be satisfied just to have a priest on earth. I want to make this very clear and I am not attempting to be critical. If someone is going to represent me before God, don't you think I have to be sure that he is acceptable to God? Is he one who has accreditation? Has he passed his bar examination so he can represent me in heaven? We can pray for one another, but we cannot represent one another in heaven. But because I need somebody to represent me, I am very happy that I have my great high priest who represents me before the Father. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices. Notice that the priest may offer both gifts and sacrifices. The writer is going to make it abundantly clear that he had something to offer. He offered himself. Compared to the precious blood of Christ, which has redeemed us, silver and gold would be like lead or dirt, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Notice that it is sins, not sin. It is plural. It speaks of the life of the believer. For example, when you lost your temper, did you go to God and confess that sin? You have a representative who is there to make intercession for you. He represents you before God. Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 5. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? We have a great high priest who could say when he came to the end of his ministry on earth, which of you convinceth me of sin? John chapter 8 verse 46. The Lord's disciples had been with him for three years and if there had been anything wrong, they would have known. He was impeccable. He did not commit any sin. Yet because he lived on this earth as a man, he understands us. He can have compassion on the ignorant. What does that mean? Compassion on the ignorant refers to the sins of ignorance. Leviticus chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 deals with these types of sins. If you don't think you have committed a sin in the past few days and you feel like you have really been living in the heights, I have news for you. You commit sins that you are not even aware of and he, our great high priest, takes care of that for us. He can have compassion on the ignorant, you see. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12. All we like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53 verse 6. God compares us to sheep because all sheep do go astray. He himself also is compassed with infirmity. Aaron was touched with infirmity or weakness, but Christ, he was touched with a feeling of our infirmity of weakness. He knows how we feel about things. He is the absolute perfect mediator, you see. When we fall, he doesn't get down in the dirt with us, but he is there to lift us up out of it. The trouble with Aaron was that he might condone the sins that he also had committed or he might condemn the sins that he had not committed himself. That would always be a danger. But Christ is able to show mercy and he neither condones nor does he condemn. When we come to him to make confession of our sins, he doesn't give us a little lecture about doing better next time. What does he do? He just extends mercy to us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just as our high priest to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Isn't it wonderful to have a high priest like us and like he is? Now we see a contrast between Aaron and Christ because there is no counterpart of this requirement of the Aaronic priesthood in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read verse 3 of chapter 5 of Hebrews. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. You will recall that on the great day of atonement, Aaron first brought a sacrifice and took the blood into the holy of holies for his own sins. He had to have his own sin question settled first before he could represent the people. There is no counterpart of this in Christ. Christ did not have to make an offering for himself. He made an offering for you and for me. Verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. As we saw earlier, Christ was a priest because he was acceptable to God. Verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. I want to make it abundantly clear that the begotten here has nothing to do with the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. It has everything to do with a garden near Calvary where he was buried after his crucifixion because that is where his resurrection took place. He was begotten from the dead. His priesthood began when he went back to heaven and that speaks of his resurrection. Dear friend, aren't you glad that we have Christ as our high priest representing us before God? It's amazing to know and to think that we have such a great influence in the very heavens. Somebody who understands enough about us to represent us before God. Yes, we are thankful to God for Jesus, our great and sufficient High Priest. Dear friends, two things that really make my heart rejoice in understanding our Bible lesson today are a priest who can sympathize with me and a priest that is acceptable and standing before God on my behalf. Those I believe are important aspects that contribute to Jesus set superior to the Levitical priesthood. Jesus was tested with every sin, perhaps with far greater weight of temptation, but he withstood them all without ever falling to one sin. He underwent the test of living was hungry, felt loneliness and pain, wept with sorrow at the loss of his friend Lazarus, was tempted with security, fame and kingship. He feels and understands our humanity. We can open our hearts with sincerity and he will not condemn us. Greater still, brothers and sisters, above Jesus understanding me and understanding you, he can find grace and help for us. His representation and advocacy are acceptable to God because He is ordained by God to be our great High Priest, impeccable yet compassionate. There are times we feel people around us don't understand us at all, even after having shared our struggles repeatedly. Worse still is their inability or reluctance to help in spite of seeing our sufferings. Sometimes in pits that we cannot help ourselves come out of. Don't be afraid anymore of disappointment, my friend. Be assured that God will help you because Jesus is our high priest. He made us acceptable by offering his life for us on the altar of the cross. God bless you. Mm -hmm.